Good morning, happy Sabbath. We'd like to welcome you to our worship service that we're doing here virtually this morning at the Pasco Riverview Seventh-day Adventist Church. As is our habit, we'd like to start out our time this morning with some prayer, inviting God's presence. Won't you join me as we pray? Father in heaven, this morning we just want to thank you for the opportunity again to pause in our life and remember that you are God. And that, Lord, even if the world falls apart, Lord, we have this time to just remain at peace and know you're still in control and to know that you have carried us this far. Lord, we're just grateful that we have the opportunity to sing our praises to you, to spend time in prayer with you, to spend time digging in your word. Lord, this morning we need your Holy Spirit's presence here in our life. And so we're asking that you would fill each of our homes uh, this morning, Lord, that you would fill our hearts and that you would lead us and guide us as we worship you this morning, that our hearts might connect with you in a special way and that our minds might be open as we spend time studying your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, our children's lesson will be brought to us by Hannah Morrison. She's got something special for us. So kids, I think you're going to enjoy this. So hi, everybody. I got this box recently, and I was wondering what was in it. Well, would you look at that? Isn't it just adorable? You can see my other chickens here. They all came from something just like this. Imagine something that size being this size once. It's tiny. That chicken is a Poland, just like my Einstein, not Einstein, but Solomon. Now Einstein, Thank you, Solomon. Einstein was Solomon's dad, and he's not around anymore. That's right, boy. I will tell that story right now. When Solomon was just a little guy, like little, little chicky here, <laughs> his father Einstein used to rule the room. And Einstein, and one of these black hens, hatched out little Solomon. And Solomon, and Feathers, over there, that's his sister, used to, used to, used to run around this hen yard all day. But they didn't just used to run around here. They ran around the garden, and down to the house, and all over the place. But, there were, there was a problem. There was a big, mean, old hawk that used to come around here. And hawk's favorite thing to eat, especially red hawks, are little baby chickies, just like this one. And Einstein loved Solomon and all the other hens very, very much. And so, Several times during the week, when the hawk would come back, Big Einstein would take on the hawk to protect his hens. And he won several times. Unfortunately, one day the hawk was after Solomon right there, when he was just a little guy. And Einstein saw the hawk, and the hawk saw Einstein, and they got squared off. And Einstein lost. And you know what? He died to protect Big Solomon there. And Little Feathers there. And all these other hens. And I was thinking about how Jesus did that for us. He died because we're his family and because he loves us very much. And he wanted us all to be safe. And since that day, that mean old hawk has never come back here. Just like Satan will never come back to the new earth when Jesus has made it. Happy Sabbath. We're going to do the song service today. And we're going to be singing three songs. And the first song is going to be Little by Little. Face. I've been ruling in his grace. Jesus. 
Grateful people take better care of themselves. Researchers found that study participants who kept a weekly gratitude journal exercised 1.5 hours more than the group who recorded daily hassles. In another study with adults having congenital and adult onset neuromuscular disorders, participants who jotted down their blessings nightly reported more hours of sleep each night, falling asleep faster and feeling more refreshed upon awakening. That's a fact. But there's hope. Each of us has a list of health habits that could use improvement. This week, enhance your lifestyle by spending a few quiet moments each day counting your blessings. After all, positive behaviors are driven by a positive attitude. Good morning and happy Sabbath to you. Since it's been quite a bit of time since we've been meeting here at the church, there have been some who've been asking questions about how to best continue their support of God's work uh, through the giving of their tithes and their offerings. So I'd like to suggest to you this morning uh, two different ways uh, just for your consideration that are probably the best ways to give at this time. The first one is to give through our online giving, and that's through our church website. If you'll go to pascosda.com, you'll see at the top of the page on the right that there is a tab that says online giving. If you'll just click on that tab, it will open up a new page that looks very much like the back of the tithe envelope that you're used to filling out on Sabbath mornings. The second way to give is to go ahead and mail a check here to the church P.O. box. If you'll just put on your envelope, Pasco Riverview Seventh-day Adventist Church, and then the address, our P.O. box 2070, Pasco, Washington, 99302. That's the second way to send if you have any questions, please feel free to call the church uh, and we will do our best to help find you some answers. We would like to thank you at this time for your generous support and service in the ministries of our church and to encourage you to continue to look for ways to be a light and a bearer of peace to our community. Our scripture reading this morning is brought to us by Caleb and McKenna, and this will be followed by a special music done from our own Katie Calderon. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture is found in Romans 3, verse 21 through 26. I will be reading from the Living Bible Translation. But now God has shown us a different way to heaven, not by being good enough and trying to keep his laws, but by a new way, though not new, really, for the scriptures told us about it long ago. Now God says he will accept and acquit us, declare us not guilty if we trust Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And we can all be saved in the same way by coming to Christ, no matter who we are or what we have been like. Yes, all have sinned, all fall short of God's glorious ideal. Yet now God declares us not guilty of offending him if we trust in Jesus Christ, who in his kindness freely takes away our sins. For God has sent Christ Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and to end all God's anger against us. He used Christ's blood and our faith as the means of saving us from his wrath. In this way, he was being entirely fair, even though he did not punish those who sinned in the former times. For he was looking forward to the time when Christ would come and take away those sins. And now in these days, also, he can receive sinners in the same way because Jesus took away their sins. But isn't this unfair for God to let criminals go free and say that they are innocent? No, for he does it in the basis of their trust in Jesus who took away their sins. Be 
Good morning. So glad that you could join us this morning. You know, it was much like this time of year that we're having right now around here. The trees were blooming, the flowers were out, it was springtime, and it was time to prepare our gardens. I was just a little boy growing up in the East Coast in the state of Virginia. My parents owned about 30 acres, and we had several orchards, and we had several gardens, and it was, to, it was time to prepare those gardens for planting. My dad had a fairly large rototiller that was kind of self-propelled, and he uh, decided to bring it home and uh, pull it off of the truck to keep it from falling off the ramps. He decided to back the truck into his shop and to put the boards up against the wall in the shop. And the idea is that that would keep the boards from pushing out as the rototiller came down off the back of the truck. The problem is I don't think he'd put much thought into what would happen as he got down to the bottom of the boards and how he would get that heavy rototiller off of the boards. And sure enough, he fired the thing up and he began to back it down slowly. And before you know it, he was pinned between the rototiller and the wall. And there was no way for him to get out. Now, I was just a boy. I wasn't big enough or strong enough to help him. But I watched what happened as he was pinned there. It didn't look comfortable at all. Sure enough, as he got to the point, he had to get it off, and the rototiller took off backwards, and as the tines pushed up, it ground into his leg, taking a big gouge out of his leg. Let me tell you what, there was blood. As he got the rototiller off to the side and he limped over to the house, I remember him walking in the door there and laying down in front of the deep sink as my mom came rushing with bandages and things to clean the wound. And I saw as he pulled his pant leg back how deep the wound was and the amount of blood that was there. And I was a little bit scared. I remember wondering as my mom cleaned out the wound with the gauze and as she tried to dress it as best as possible, why it was that she just kept letting it bleed. And she told me something interesting that I've never forgot to this day. She says there's cleansing power in blood. I invite you to join with me as we begin with prayer this morning. Father in heaven, we just want to ask again this morning as we study your word that you would be with us as we dig in. And I pray that the lessons that we would learn this morning, Lord, might be encouraging to our soul and that they might give us courage to stand on your word and do what you've asked us to do and trust that your power will do what you've promised it will we pray these things in your name. Amen. Over the last week, many around the world celebrated the resurrection of Christ. I don't know if you stopped to think about why it is that this is the time of year that we celebrate that, but the reason is because Jesus died and was resurrected during the feast of the Passover. The Passover is not only the most significant of the Jewish celebrations, it's also something that has a message that is very central to the heart of Christianity. It's the story of how our freedom was obtained. This morning, I'd like to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter 4. We're going to begin just by looking at Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 and 23. Again, that's Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 and 23. The Bible says that God said to Moses, You shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Over 430 years before, God had told the patriarch Abraham, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not their own, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. When the Israelites had first come to Egypt, they had come with honor. Joseph, who was Abraham's son, was the second highest ruler in the land. He was only under Pharaoh. And he was given, because of his great help during the time of the famines, the land of Goshen, where the Israelites moved. It was the greatest and most fertile land in all of Egypt. But the book of Exodus begins by saying, Now a new king arose over Egypt, 
who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply, and in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us, and fight against us, and depart from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor, and they built for Pharaoh storage cities, Python and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread out, so that they were in the dread of the sons of Israel. The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks and in all kinds of labor in the field, all their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. Exodus 1, verses 8 through 14. Exodus chapter 3, verses 23 through 25 says, Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. What took God so long to help his people? You know, maybe we could answer that question by asking a different question. What took God's people so long to ask for help? You know, in digging into the passage, there's actually no indication that God's people cried out to help for God at all while things were prosperous. They only did that after things started to go bad. While life was pleasant in the land of Goshen, they didn't sense any need for God's help. They didn't sense a need to leave Egypt and head for Canaan. There was little sense of really needing God at all. In fact, the careful study of the book of Exodus will show us that God's people actually backslid an awful lot while they were living in Egypt. While in Egypt, God's people forgot much of God's word, and their faith in him grew weak. Much of the book of Exodus actually shows the great extent to which God went to try and establish again in his people an unwavering faith, and to teach them again the truths and promises of his word. The book Patriarchs and Prophets points out, The Hebrews had expected to obtain their freedom without any special trial of their faith or any real suffering or hardship, but they were not yet prepared for deliverance. They had little faith in God and were unwilling patiently to endure their afflictions until he should see fit to work for them. Many were content to remain in bondage rather than meet the difficulties attending removal to a strange land, and the habits of some had become so much like those of the Egyptians that they preferred to dwell in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord did not deliver them by the first manifestation of his power before Pharaoh. He overruled events more fully to develop the tyrannical spirit of the Egyptian king and also to reveal himself to his people. Beholding his justice, his power, and his love, they would choose to leave Egypt and give themselves to his service. The task of Moses would have been much less difficult had not many of the Israelites become so corrupted that they were unwilling to leave Egypt. Page 260. You know, it's a sad fact that the same thing can be seen repeatedly throughout the Bible record. Many times it wasn't until after things became very bitter that God's people realized their need to turn to him. Many times through history, he has allowed events to go horribly wrong in hopes of catching the attention of his people and bringing them to the place where they were willing to let go of the very thing that was leading to their destruction. And even afterwards, God oftentimes doesn't take the pressure off or take the struggle completely away as he's trying to teach his people that they need dependence on him all of the time. And so God told Moses ahead of time, but I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all of my miracles, which I shall do in the midst of it. And after that, he will let you go. So at this point, nine plagues have come and gone. Only the worst one is left to happen. 
Time and again, God has shown the absolute futility of trusting in the Egyptian gods. Time and again, he has revealed his power. And time and again, the Egyptian king has hardened his heart and refused to let God's people go. You see, Satan never lets go of his captives easy. If promises of pleasure and of prosperity don't work, he often turns to threats and even death. Pharaoh's last conversation with Moses ended with this threat. Get away from me. Beware. Do not see my face again. For in the day you see my face, you shall die. But then the Bible says in Exodus 11, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, one more plague I will bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt. And after that, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out from here completely. And so God sends Moses back to face Pharaoh in the face of the death threats with one last warning. The Bible says, thus says the Lord, about midnight, I'm going out into the midst of Egypt and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the millstone, all the firstborn of the cattle as well. Moreover, there shall be a great cry in all the land of Egypt, such as there has not been before and such as shall never be again. But against any of the sons of Israel, a dog will not even bark, whether against man or beast, that you may understand how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these your servants will come and bow down themselves before me, saying, Go out, you and all the people who follow you, and after that, I will go out. And then Moses went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. You know, an astute scholar of justice would be right to pause here and ask the question, what right does God have to cast judgment against the Egyptians while ruling in favor of Israel when Israel was just as guilty of sin and rebellion against God as had been the Egyptians? The next 40 years of Israel's history are all that it takes to prove that God's people themselves were a stubborn, stiff-necked, and rebellious people. And God says so repeatedly through Scripture. Since neither nation was righteous before God, how is it just that God acted in favor towards one and against another? The Apostle Paul asks a similar question in our Scripture reading this morning when he says this, but isn't this unfair for God to let criminals go free and say that they're innocent? No, for he does it on the basis of their trust in Jesus, who took away their sins. So how did God pull this off? The Bible tells us, Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one, according to the number of persons in them. According to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb." Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lentil of the house in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it until morning you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded and your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, 
And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So let's break this down and make it simple. God's instructions were as follows. Number one, each household was instructed to take a one-year-old unblemished male lamb and they were to slaughter it at twilight on the 14th day of the new month. Number two, the blood of the slain lamb was to be collected in a bowl and with a hyssop branch, a symbol of purification throughout all of scripture, it was to be applied to the doorposts and the lentil of the house. Number three, then the lamb was to be roasted with fire and eaten by everyone in the house with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They were to eat all of it completely, and if there was any left over, it was to be totally consumed by fire. A few verses later, God actually instructs his people that they should have no leaven found in their house at all at this time, and that if anyone was to eat anything that had leaven in it, they were cut off from among God's people. Number four. The people were to eat the food quickly and to be dressed and ready to leave right away. And number five, before the chapter closes, God adds that the food was to all be eaten in their house and that they were not to leave and go outside. And so God's people were to separate themselves from those who were not in their house. Pretty simple instructions, aren't they? Those who obey God and followed his instructions were safe. And those who disregarded them were not protected from the angel that would fly over, destroying the firstborn. Verses 21 to 23 say, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lentil and two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through the, to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your house and smite you. Just imagine what it must have been like on that last night. There was a great division among the people in the land between those that believed and between those that scoffed. Those that scoffed didn't see this night as any different than any other night. But those who believed, I'm sure that they held on tightly to their firstborn. I doubt that any one of God's people slept very much that night. While the wicked lay sleeping in a false peace, God's people, to them, it seemed like a night that would never end. The Bible says in verse 29, Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the cattle. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all of his servants and all the Egyptian, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. But not a single one from the family of God's people was lost that night. Not one. One writer notes, Before obtaining freedom, the bondmen must show their faith in the great deliverance about to be accomplished. The token of blood must be placed upon their house, and they must separate themselves and their families from the Egyptians and gather within their own dwellings. Had the Israelites disregarded in any particular the directions given them? Had they neglected to separate their children from the Egyptians? Had they slain the lamb but failed to strike the doorpost with the blood? Or had any gone out of their houses? They would not have been secure." They might have honestly believed that they had done all that was necessary, but their sincerity would not have saved them. All who failed to heed the Lord's directions would lose their firstborn by the hand of the destroyer. Just as God said it would be, he made a distinction that day between the Egyptians and the Israelites, between those who served him and those who didn't. The Bible says, then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, Rise up, get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go, worship the Lord as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds as you have said, and go and bless me also. The Egyptian urged the people and send them away out of the land in haste, for they said, We will all be dead. 
God won a great victory for his people that day. There's some lessons today that I'd like us to just pull out of the things that we've been studying. What God did for his people that night has been repeated, and it's going to be repeated again. The symbolism in our story this morning teaches us how we're to cooperate with God in his work of the salvation of our lives. So number one, the lamb. Well, this represents Jesus, whom the Bible says is the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world, and also says that Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In him alone is our hope of salvation. And it's only by his blood that we can be cleansed from sin. Number two, the leaven. All through the Bible, the leaven represents sin. Paul wrote in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Number three, the unleavened bread also represents Jesus. Jesus said in the book of John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life, and he who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. Then there's the hyssop branch. The hyssop branch was used for applying the blood on the doorposts, and on the lintel. And all through scripture, it's used as a symbol of purification from sin. In Psalms 51, verse 7, King David prayed, Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. So what about some takeaways for us today? There's three of them that I'd like to share with you this morning. The first one is this. The doorposts of the house are the symbol of our lives. Notice in the story that it wasn't enough to just slay the lamb, but the blood of the lamb had to be collected in a bowl and then applied to the doorposts of the house. In the same way, the merits of Christ's blood must be applied to each one of us individually. We're to believe more than that Jesus just died for the sins of the world. We need to believe that Jesus died for me. We're to apply the merits of his life to our life. We're to make his life and death our own. And just as each individual was to apply the blood with the hyssop branch to his own house, so also each one of us must do that work ourselves. No one else can do do that for us. And we can't do it for someone else either. The work of casting out sin from our lives is the work that we must decide to do. While the power to do it comes from God by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, only you and I can make the decision for it to be done. Even God does not do this for us. Number two, the lamb and the unleavened bread were to be eaten with bitter herbs as a reminder of our lives which were once enslaved by sin, but which are now free to walk in the newness of life. In the same way, we're instructed to feed on the life of Jesus by daily study, meditation, and application of his word in our life. Jesus once said, I am the bread of life, and this is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. This is also something that no one else can do for us. We have to do it for ourselves. In him is life. His life is like the tree of life, that if we will eat from it, we will live forever. But we must feed on him individually, for his provisions don't do us any good otherwise. Takeaway number three. The instructions to be dressed and ready to go should remind us that we should always be ready for Christ's soon return so that it doesn't catch us off guard. The Bible tells us that one day Jesus shared a parable with his disciples about ten virgins or ten bridesmaids who were waiting for the bridegroom to return to his wedding feast. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise, Jesus said. Five of them hadn't prepared for the long wait 
and the oil in their lamps ran out, while the other five had prepared by bringing ample oil with them. Finally, late at night, the cry rang out, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming. And it was then that the foolish virgins discovered they had not prepared very well. But the wise virgins were there with their oil, so they cried out to them, please give us some of your oil. But the wise virgins replied, no, because then there won't be enough for us and for you. Instead, go and buy some more oil. So in a panic, the foolish virgins ran out to try and find some new oil, but it was too late. When they came back to the feast, the wise virgins had already gone in, and the door was closed, and the foolish virgins were not allowed to go in. Jesus ends the parable with these words of warning. Be on alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour of your Lord's return. There's so many more things that we could learn from our scripture passage this morning. There's so much more that I want to share with you, but that's enough for now. I'd like today to just appeal to you to put into practice some of the things that we've learned. Look at the sacrifice of Christ as the only hope that you have for salvation. It's my prayer that we will look to him and the merits of his blood and put our faith and hope in that. But it's my prayer that we would go beyond that and that we would actually apply the merits of both his death and his life to our own lives. That we would accept his death in place of our death and that we would invite his spirit's presence into our life each day that we might live by his life every day. And that we would do that work individually. It's my prayer that as we do that, we will be standing ready every day so that when our master returns, he won't catch us unaware. Won't you make that decision today, just between you and God? Won't you join with me as we close in prayer? Father in heaven, I just want to close our study today by thanking you for the provisions that you've made. Lord, you've made everything that we need for salvation readily available to us. But Lord, you've also taught us that we need to apply those provisions to our lives or they don't do us any good at all. Lord, I just want to pray that we might remember you could deposit a million dollars into our bank account. But if we don't take the time to go and pull the money out of the account, it does us no good. I pray, Lord, that we would learn how each day to look to you as our only hope, that we would learn the life of dependence on you and not grow weak in our faith and not lose sight of your word, to learn to stand on your promises, Lord. I pray that you would teach us, Lord, the life of walking in your spirit each day so that you live through us a new life, that you serve your life through us in reaching our communities and in changing our hearts and in making us ready for God. Lord, teach us not to trust in anything that we can do in and apart from you. Lord, this is our prayer this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.